I've had the pleasure of working with beekeepers for over 40 years. Tonight I want to talk to you about colony development and relation to the glandular systems of the honeybee. Now some of you say, whoa, that's over my head, I don't need all that. Well, I'm going to try and keep it real simple. I just want you to realize that there are a lot of different kinds of glands associated with honeybees. There's a lot that we do not know about these glands. And these glands are interactive with each other, or the products of these glands are interactive with each other, causing various things to occur in reproduction and development of the bee. Um, and the other point that I want to ultimately get to this evening is you need to realize that almost all of these glands and the products of these glands are associated with bee nutrition. So from a beekeeping standpoint, from a management standpoint, you need to be concerned with the nutrition of your hives. Do they have adequate nutrition? And so we're going to divide this really into, into two basic topics. We're going to talk about colony development, first of all, and why it's so important to beekeeping. And secondly, then we will talk some about uh, nutrition. Understanding bee biology, understanding the creature that you're working with is extremely important because it's the foundation of colony management. When you go into a hive, you begin to look. What are the conditions? Is it the way it should be at this time of year? Or is there something not right? And so you need to make those decisions. And you have to understand the subtle cues that the bees provide you in telling you whether the the hive is in good condition or not. So, so colony management is going to be extremely important. Success in beekeeping is going to be dependent upon your ability to develop strong productive colonies. Okay? Now, the, you will hear me talk about strong, productive colonies over and over and over. You think I'm beating a dead horse. But I have found in my 40 plus years of teaching beekeeping, that is a, that is a concept or an, an idea that new beginners, new beekeepers or beginning beekeepers have difficult grasping. Okay? It's just words. Strong, productive colonies. Productive's okay. How much honey did you produce? Okay? But strong is the, the difficult aspect of it. You see, somebody that's relatively inexperienced in bees, they may look at 5,000 bees in a hive, and they say, wow, look at all those bees. Look at all those stingers, okay? To, to them, that is an extremely strong hive. But when I'm talking about strong hives, I'm talking about populations of 40 to 60,000 bees. And so I'm going to be concerned primarily tonight is you as a beekeeper, how do you get 40 to 60,000 bees? And that's what we're going to be uh, talking about primarily. You have to be a naturalist. You need to know when the honey flows of your area are likely to occur. If your primary honey flow occurs in May, but you do not have your colonies in peak condition until July 1, You've just lost, okay? 
So you've got to know when do I have to have my colonies in peak condition in preparation for your anticipated honey flows of your particular area. Yes, honeybees may work a hundred or more species of flowers. But if you were to analyze the, the honey that they produce, you would find that the majority of surplus honey produced by your colonies is probably coming for, from two or three sources, if you're lucky. Some of you, it might be only one source. So you need to know what are those primary honey plants or major honey plants that's going to give you the most honey. When do they bloom? When do you have to have your colonies in peak condition? You've got to have the, the, the peak population of bees before the major honey flow or honey flows of your particular area. If you're going to have a colony with 40 to 60,000 bees, that means conditions have to be right within that hive so that they can reproduce and develop at a maximum rate. And a large part of reproduction is associated with the glandular systems of the bee. Honeybees basically have two types of glands. They have what we call endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands produce hormones. And hormones are released into the blood or the hemolymph of the bee. They're internal. They regulate only the individual that produces them. Okay? So the hormones that are produced and released into the blood of the individual bee cause various glands to develop, cause uh, various reproductive processes to occur, etc. But it only affects that particular individual. The exocrine glands produce their substances to the exterior of the organism. So endocrine is internal, exocrine is external. They're produced with, from within the body of the bee, but the substances that are produced are released to the outside of the bee and all, many of them are going to affect the other individuals making up the society or making up the family of bees. Products of exocrine glands include beeswax, venom, pheromones, enzymes, royal jelly, worker jelly, drone jelly. Now some of you may say, well I've heard of royal jelly, but I've not heard of worker jelly, drone jelly. Well what you need to realize people is that when that tiny larva is there in the, within the cell, the nurse bees that come along, and we're going to talk more about nurse bees in a few minutes, the nurse bees that come along they recognize, is this individual destined to become a queen, destined to become a worker, or destined to become a drone? And so the chemical makeup of the food that's provided is different for the three casts of bees. We routinely use the, the term royal jelly. But you need to realize, analytically, royal jelly, or I'll call it queen jelly, queen jelly is different biochemically than worker jelly or drone jelly. But the point here is, all of these products, 
either directly or indirectly affect reproduction of the hive. But they are produced to the exterior of the organism and so they're going to affect other members of that society. These products are associated with bee behavior. Primary example, we've already talked about it a little bit in here, queen mandibular pheromone. Okay? The queen's pheromone affects the other members of the, of the colony. They use it to recognize her, recognize her presence, to evaluate her as to her quality. Should she stay or should she be replaced? That's all based on her, her chemical profile. So, be behavior, communication. All right, here's this tiny little legless little white grub lying in the bottom of a cell. They tell that nurse bee, I'm going to be a drone, so feed me the right jelly. Okay? So the nurse bees have to recognize, and they have to be able to make the right jelly for the organism that they're feeding. Regulation of all kinds of metabolic processes. Uh, defense, venom, is produced for the defense of the individual. Defense of the colony. Wax, it's for the establishment of the brood nest and the establishment of combs in which to store food. And so there has to be stimuli associated with the production of wax so that wax is produced when the colony needs it. So not only do all the workers have to know when certain things need to happen, when certain glands need to function, but then they need to be able to, to accomplish that task uh, as well. Larval honeybees. It doesn't matter if they're from a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg. They have three important endocrine glands. Remember, hormone producing glands. All right? We have the prothoracic gland, something called the corpora allata, and corpora cardiaca. The last two are found both in larvae and adults. These are hormones that are involved in completing development. After the egg hatches in completing development and being transformed into the pupil stage and ultimately the adult stage. The prothoracic gland is only found in larvae. It's a small leaf-like structure found between the first and second thoracic segments. As I said, it's not present in the adult bee. But the importance of the prothoracic gland, it produces a hormone called ecdysone. We, another word for ecdysone is molting for hormone. All right, as a larva grows, as a pupa develops and grows, it sheds its exterior skin. We call that molting. That is under the control of the hormone ecdysone. Uh, and so you can see why it's only found in, in, in the brood form and not in the adult form because it's only associated with uh, the shedding of the larval or the last pupil skin. The corpora alata are two small globular glands or masses of tissue that are found on the sides of the esophagus. The esophagus is the food tube. Mouth, proboscis, mouth, food tube, esophagus, leading to the crop or to the honey stomach, okay? So it's behind the brain. The esophagus comes under, 
under the brain, the esophagus comes under the brain and, and uh, continues on through the interior of the bee. And there's these two little globular uh, structures uh, right alongside the esophagus. The corpus cardiacum is right behind, right behind the corpora allata. And it's on the walls of the aorta. The aorta is the heart. Again, we have a dorsal blood vessel that we call the heart or the aorta in the bee that pumps the blood from the, the back of the bee to the front of the bee, empties out in the region of, of the brain. They have an open circulatory system. And so the transfer of nutrients, the transfer of waste within the bee is associated with the pumping of the blood uh, from the back of the bee to the front of the bee, okay? And so uh, that's where the corpus cardiacum is located. The actual function is unknown. However, the corpora allata is connected to the corpora cardica or, and also to neurosecretory cells of the brain. So we got nerves going between the brain and these two endocrine glands, okay? So that means then there is neural control of what's going on uh, within the corpora allata. The brain regulates the activity of the corpora allata through neural and neuroendocrine signals, in other words, chemicals. Um, uh, that are produced by the brain and, and go uh, to these two structures. But the importance from a standpoint of reproduction, and then we're, going to, we're going to get simpler again here, the importance of the corpora allata is that it produces a hormone called juvenile hormone. Now I've already said that we have a molting a molting hormone that causes the, the organism to shed its skin. But what determines as we move from, uh, say, the second larval instar or the second larval growth stage to the third larval growth stage to the fourth larval growth stage, then ultimately to the pupa, that is under the control of juvenile hormone. And so it involves then uh, handling the development of uh, the, the larvae and the pupae. The amount of juvenile hormone secreted is proportional to the size of the glands. And since queens have much higher levels of juvenile hormone than, than workers, obviously, as would be expected, uh, they have larger corpora allata as, as well. Now, I said juvenile hormone controls the development of larvae and pupae. But juvenile hormone also is involved in adult bees. It's involved in the laying of eggs by the queen. It's also involved in the worker caste associated with what we call division of labor. If we looked at what bees do as they age, we call that division of labor, okay? So a bee performs first tasks, we'll say cleaning brood cells. Then it may become a nurse bee feeding young larvae. Then it may become a wax producer. Then it may become a wax builder and a house bee that handles incoming nectar, or a house bee that handles a packing of pollen in cells with their head, um, and then ultimately a field bee. All of this is under the control of juvenile hormone. So you can see how important it is in the development of the colony. These are some of the glands that we've talked about. These are the exocrine glands. 
And I want to point these out to you because we're going to talk about them in more detail. First of all, this structure here is the mandible, the jaw of the bee. Now our jaw goes up and down. The worker's jaw goes like this, from the side. All right, so what it's showing then, you see this black sac attached to the mandible? This is called the mandibular gland. And queens have mandibular glands, and workers have mandibular glands. And we'll talk more about the importance of them. We often hear about brood food glands, or the hypopharyngeal glands, as they're called. These are the coils that look like bunches of grapes located here. So this is the brood food gland, or the hypopharyngeal gland. Then we have a salivary gland. Uh, as Frank said, I, I wrote an article on bee spit. I didn't call it bee spit, but okay. This is the salivary gland that's found in the head. These are the salivary glands that are found within the thorax. We're going to be talking a lot about the mandibular gland and the hypopharyngeal gland, so I want you to keep these uh, in, in mind. Then we have the tarsal glands, which is the source of the footprint pheromone that Frank mentions my last article was on. Here we have the wax glands. Here we have the venom sac of, and the production of uh, venom. And here we have uh, what's called the Nasinoff gland or the scent gland. There are other glands as well, but these are the major ones. Uh, and we're not going to talk about all of them tonight. We're just going to talk about a few of them in relation to uh, the development of the colony. What I want you to realize is that each member of the colony has a definite task to perform, but it takes the combined efforts of the entire colony to survive and reproduce. When you first look in a hive, and you've got several thousand bees crawling around, it look like, may look like mass confusion to you. But what you need to realize each one has a job to do. They know what that job is, and they go about it. Slackers don't make it in the, in the population. Okay? So each member has a certain task to do. And that task will change over time, as we're going to see. As we said, we call this division of labor. Who's doing what when? Who's doing what when is what you want to think about. Now there, there are two basic factors that regulate the division of labor. First of all is the worker's age. As workers age, get older, glands will develop, glands will uh, become vestigial, other glands will develop, they become vestigial, etc. throughout the life of the worker. And so worker age will partly determine the division of labor. We, we could easily put in parentheses, instead of worker age, we could talk about development of glands. So as different glands develop, the task of the bee uh, changes. But division of labor is also associated with colony needs. Let me give you an example. The hypopharyngeal glands or the brood food glands, bees are typically nurse bees from about day 5 to day 12 to 15. Okay? So that's the time period when their brood food glands are functioning and they are caring for young bees. Let's say we go in and we remove a bunch of the young bees. We make a split and we remove a large proportion of the nurse bee population. Suddenly there are not adequate numbers of bees to feed the, the young that are hatching from the eggs that's currently being laid by the queen. Well, an old field bee whose brood food glands have disintegrated, shriveled up, 
are non-functional over a few days period, they can rejuvenate those brood food glands and become nurse bees. We would call them old nurse bees. <laughs> but that need ar arose in the colony because of something you did in making the splits and so they are able to sense that need and so they can go back and rejuvenate uh, some of their glandular systems. I want to tell you that the most populous colonies are your most productive colonies. And I also want to tell you that you're going to get the greatest payoff from your bees as you're successful in producing populations between 40 and 60,000 bees. 40 to 60,000 bees is where your greatest payoff is occur. And that literally means the colony is boiling over with bees as you see there. The other thing that I want you to think about this evening is that there are three components to the colony that are extremely important in having a productive colony. You need to have an excellent queen, you need to have a large nurse bee population, and you must have a large field force. Okay? These are the important ones. If one of these three is lacking, you're not going to have a productive colony at least not right at that point in, in time. And so from a management standpoint, if something goes haywire here, then you need to get involved and correct the situation. But these are the three important components. Colony development, and that's what we're talking about this evening. How do you go in the spring from having 15, 20,000 bees to having 40 to 60,000 bees? What conditions must be present in order for you to, to reach that goal. Well, we're going to talk more about it, but certainly the quality of the queen is extremely important. You need to provide adequate space for her to lay eggs. If she's if at the point in her uh, lifetime she can lay 1,500 eggs a day, she needs to have that many cells available to her so she can lay the 15 hundred eggs per day. And the nutritional state of the colony is going to impact the reproductive success of that colony. Individual bees cannot survive by themselves. I suspect some of you are going to find that hard to believe, but they just can't do it by themselves. Small, weak colonies are unable to establish the social structure and provide conditions that lead to colony development. I wished I could tell you what is the lowest number of bees that you can have and that they still survive. We really don't know. You know, some people might think 50. My gut feeling is probably two to three thousand. But I don't have any scientific evidence to support that. You just need to realize it takes a large number of bees in order to survive, in order to reproduce, and in order to maintain an environment that will allow reproduction to, to go forward. So we really don't know what that lower figure is, but you need to realize it's best to be on the safe side and have strong colonies. Part of it has to do with numbers. Are there adequate bees to care for the eggs that the queen lays each day when they hatch? Are there adequate numbers of bees to maintain a brood nest temperature of 93 to 95 degrees? Are there adequate enough bees to go to the field and to store surplus food for the colony? 
These are things that you need to think about as a bee manager. This probably will knock your socks off. A worker larva lasts for how long? Worker larva. Six days, right? Six days. In that six day period, each larva is going to require somewhere between two to three thousand nurse bee visits. So do you see why I said having a large nurse bee population is so important? Especially if your queen's laying 1,500 eggs a day. Okay? So nursing activity is extremely important. We talked a little bit about jelly, royal jelly, worker jelly, drone jelly already, but let me talk about it a little bit more. It's an extremely complex substance produced by two different glands. I suspect most of you didn't realize that. When we talk about brood food, we talk about the jellies, we always think about the hypopharyngeal glands or the brood food glands. But what I'm telling you is the hypopharyngeal glands as well as the mandibular glands are involved in the production of food for young larvae. We showed you a picture already, the hypopharyngeal glands in the front of the head. Remember the large coil that looked like a, bu a bunch of grapes? All right. They're, on each si they're in the front of the head and they're on each side of the front of the head. They're chains of oval glandular lobes called axini, uh, numbering over 550 on each side. So if that bee is going to be a good nurse bee, then it's got to have all of those glands active and producing uh, food. The hypopharyngeal glands secrete the clear component of brood food. Some of you say, I didn't know there was a clear component. When I think of royal jelly, I think of a creamy, milky substance that you see in the bottom of a queen cell. But there's actually a clear component as well as this creamy or, or white component. And it's actually the hypopharyngeal glands or the brood food glands that produce uh, the clear component. And as we said here, it's rich in enzymes, lipids, which are fats, uh, vitamins, and proteins. The mandibular glands of the workers produce the white component of royal jelly, and it's, prim it's primarily made up of fats or, or lipids. And one of the key components, and there are many components, there are vitamins, uh, there are enzymes, there are all sorts of things present in the mandibular gland secretion, but the main one is 10-hydroxy-2-decanoic acid. Don't expect you to remember that. Just want you to realize as nurse bees, as young bees, the workers produce this component of the royal jelly and the worker jelly and the drone jelly. However, once the mandibular glands stop secreting brood food, they start secreting 2-heptanone, which is an alarm pheromone that bees use in marking individuals, the guard bees use in marking individuals that come to the entrance of the hive. So here the same gland in a worker when it's young, produces brood food. When it's old, produces an alarm pheromone. So the functions of these glands can change. Uh, again, here we see the mandible that's been extracted. And this is the sac uh, that we call the mandibular gland. And of course, in the queen, this is where queen pheromone or queen mandibular pheromone is produced. But we're only concerned about, the, about workers here. The composition of royal jelly that's fed to young larvae uh, changes 
as that larvae uh, ages. And likewise, the, the royal jelly that's fed to the queens are different than what is fed to the worker larvae, and it changes again uh, with age. The first three days of producing brood food, uh, the white is mostly the white mandibular gland component. But the days four and five contains more, more of the clear hypopharyngeal gland component, which is, which is rich in protein. To make the point a bit further that, that worker jelly and queen jelly and, and, and drone jelly are different, uh, Royal jelly contains 34% sugar during the first three days that, that it's produced. In comparison, worker jelly only contains 12% sugar. Now, why so much sugar in the queen's jelly in comparison to the worker? And it has to do. A queen has to develop faster, much faster, four and a half days. Four and a half days in the larval period or in the feeding period in comparison to six days in, in the workers. And so they're saying this high concentration of sugar acts as what we call a phagostimulant. In other words, the desire or, or of having a voracious appetite to cause that queen to feed faster and to consume more. And so the more sugar we inject, the faster the results, okay? Kind of like your children consuming a lot of sugar and getting highs, okay? Same idea, principle is here in relation to the queen cast versus the, the worker cast. All right, I said another important point in, in colony development is to have an excellent queen. And I could spend all evening lecturing on this topic, but I was just a few little points that I want to hit upon. I want you to ask yourself, what makes a good queen? But more importantly, how do you determine if you've got a good queen or not? Okay, look at her brood pattern, and you're absolutely right. We'll talk about that more. Look at that queen, isn't she a beauty? Maybe. I was going to say, is she good? We have no idea by just looking at her. We have to look at her brood pattern. She might be a nice looker, but that doesn't mean she's good. So you're going to evaluate the queen on the basis of colony characteristics. First of all, you're going to look at her brood pattern. Secondly, you're going to look at the behavior on the queen on the combs. Some colonies you open up, you happen to see the queen, and she just goes on laying eggs as though nothing has happened. Other queens are running all over the place and, and you, you can't even keep up with them. Well, while they're running, they're not laying eggs, okay? So you might consider the queen's behavior. Temperament of workers. I'll be the first to tell you that some of my most productive colonies are my most aggressive colonies or defensive colonies or mean colonies, all right? However, it gets to a point where you just can't put up with it anymore, okay? And so to deal with that situation, we would recommend that you requeen with a, with a different queen. So you consider that, consider production records, et cetera, in evaluating the queen. You cannot evaluate a queen just by looking at her one time or looking at her brood pattern one time. You've got to do it over a series of a few weeks to really get a good idea of how good a producer she is. We look at her brood pattern. This is a nice, solid brood pattern. This was taken in early spring, so it's not a large brood pattern, but it's a solid brood pattern, and we would have to conclude that she's a good queen. This is later in the season. Likewise, we'd make the same conclusion. This is an excellent queen. This is, this is a good brood pattern. 
But then we see this. Spotty brood pattern. Now we talked about that in our opening session. A lot of factors can cause a spotty brood pattern, but one of them is the quality of the queen, and this needs to be investigated further. All right. Ideally, if you're going to have a colony develop at a maximum rate, you've got to provide an environment that will allow the queen to lay at a maximum rate, as you see here. So you need to think about space, you need to think about open cells, you need to think about an adequate supply of young bees or nurse bees. Do I have any procrastinators in here? Any procrastinators? Well, right here's the king of procrastination. I admit it. But if you're going to have a colony reproducing at a maximum rate to provide you with a large field force to go to the field, you have to have conditions that will allow that queen to be laying at a maximum rate at least, at least six weeks before that field force is needed. Do you plan six weeks in advance? I suspect most of us don't. Six weeks. Why six weeks? Well, the queen lays an egg. In 21 days, a worker emerges. That's three weeks, right? The next three weeks, she's a house bee. So that's six weeks before she's ready to go to the field, or approximately. So that's why you've got to look at conditions within the hive at least six weeks before you need a maximum population. We have found significant correlations between egg laying rate, population size, and honey production. There are many factors that affect the number of eggs that a queen is laying or can lay. There are genetic factors, there is her physiological condition, the quality of food that she's being fed, the quantity of food that she's being fed, the size of her ovaries, which we'll meet more to you in just a minute, and her success on her mating flight or mating flights. All right, these are all factors that affect how many eggs a queen can lay. The actual number of eggs that the queen lays at a specific time is going to depend upon the number of nurse bees, depend upon the brood nest temperature, which I already indicated needs to be 93 to 95, and the amount of fresh nectar and pollen coming in. That's what's ultimately going to determine how many eggs a queen lays uh, each day. Let's look at the structure of the, of the uh, queen's reproductive system. These two large pear-shaped structures are her ovaries. You will notice that the ovaries are made up of a series of tubes. These tubes are called ovarials. I want you to think of each tube or each ovarial as being an assembly line, like in a giant factory. How many assembly lines do you have? How many assembly lines are operating? That determines your final output, right? Likewise, she's got all of these assembly lines and eggs are developing within those tubes. There's a big variation in the number of ovarials or tubes making up her ovaries. It can vary anywhere from 130 to 186 ovarials per ovary. So that's, that's a big difference. And it has a lot to do with her genetics and her nutrition during development, okay? There may be some other factors as well, but those are the two of the primary ones. Was there a question up here? Uh, is, there, is there anything to do with the breed of the bee, like brushes? Yes, yes. There's differences in races, which is genetic. There's differences in uh, what age was she, she selected to become a queen. 
the nutrition or the diet that she received while she was going through, through queen development, all of these factors are going to affect how many ovarials there are in an ovary. Queens with a 300 or more ovarials are considered to be good queens. That would be 150 per ovary, okay? We said there could be 186 per ovary, so we don't have to have the top number, but any, any queen that has 300 or more ovarials, she would be considered to be of good quality. I'm not suggesting you go start counting <laughs> ovarials. <laughs> Leave that up to the scientists. However, I will tell you, the heaviest queens, the largest queens, will have the largest ovaries or the most ovarials. In agriculture, in agriculture, we have something that we call culling. All right, so what I would say to you, you need to cull, say, a quarter of your lightest queens, your smallest queens. Or if you're looking at queen cells, you need to cull a quarter of your queen cells. You're going to look at size, you're going to look at length, you're going to look at the amount of sculpturing on the outside of those cells. So culling is important. I'm not asking you to count ovarials, I'm just saying you need to realize your heaviest queens, your biggest queens probably will be your most productive queens or your best queens. You also need to realize that until colony strength approaches fr 10 frames, in other words, 10 combs covered with bees, until you reach that population, the queen is unable to lay at her full capacity. Okay? That's one, one approach. Another approach, I'm only going to look at the dotted line. All right, the dotted line. Along the bottom here, I guess I ought to point to it here, shouldn't I? Along the bottom here, this is 10,000 bees, 20,000 bees, 30, 40, 50, 60. The take home message is when a population reaches 40,000 bees, the queen will be laying at her maximum rate. That's why I said your biggest payoff is going to come from your ability to develop populations between 40 and 60 percent, okay? Or 60,000, excuse me, 40 to 60,000. All right, we've talked about how important queen fecundity is or the number of eggs she lays. Uh, just going to briefly go into this uh, quickly. There's a basic relationship between the amount of brood and the adult population that determines the rate or growth of a colony. As the colony population increases, the efficiency of the colony improves. As that population increases, a smaller proportion of bees are needed to maintain internal conditions, which ultimately will provide you then with a larger uh, field force. Some actual numbers. 10,000 bees can support 8,500 cells of brood or the ratio of brood to adult bees is 0.85, all right? But let's jump down to 30,000. Yes, they can produce more brood, but the ratio drops to 0.61. The point here is every increase in 10,000 bees, there's a decrease in the brood to adult ratio. But what does it mean a different way? A large colony produces more brood than a small colony, yet has a higher proportion of bees available for gathering nectar and honey. Another study, different numbers, but the same principle. All right, 10,000 bees, you'll have 2,000 foragers. 20,000 bees, you'll have 5,000 foragers. 40,000 bees, you'll have 20,000 foragers. 
60,000 bees, you'll have 39. All right, what's the take home message? If the queen is laying her maximum rate at 40,000, so your ability to go from 40,000 to 60,000 is where your real payoff is going to occur. Hopefully I haven't lost too many of you there on that point. All right, let's look at it differently. I've got five colonies in my apiary, okay? Colony A has 60,000 bees in it. Colony B has 15,000. Colony C has 15,000. Colony D has 15,000. And Colony E has 15,000. So these four colonies combined have 60,000 bees. So those 60,000 bees ought to be equal to this one colony with 60,000 bees. When I went to school, 60,000 equals 60,000, they're the same. But it's not in beekeeping. It's not in beekeeping. A colony, a full strength colony with 60,000 bees will normally produce 50% more honey than four colonies each with 15,000 bees. And this is the point I was making. As the population goes up, so does the efficiency, so does the production per individual bee, average production per individual bee uh, goes up. And your success is between 40 and 60,000 bees. I've talked a lot about bee biology tonight, but I've only scratched the surface, the tip of the iceberg. But again, I didn't cover all of these aspects, but the point I want you to realize, by understanding bee biology, and applying it, it will assist you in your management of your colonies. It will assist you in developing strong colonies, assist you in your swarm management practices, it will assist you in requeening colonies, and in evaluating the queen. We said there are two types of glands. There are endocrine glands that produce hormones. And those hormones are related to the nutrition of that individual bee. Exocrine glands produce substances to the exterior. The biggest group of exocrine substances are pheromones. We didn't talk hardly any on pheromones tonight. But you need to realize they too are strongly related to the nutrition of the colony. And so by understanding this, hopefully, then you will be more successful as a beekeeper and in the ability of developing strong colonies. Providing an environment with good nutrition, adequate space, a good quality queen, a large nurse bee population, and a large field force, and when conditions will allow, you will have a productive colony. Thank you very much. Thank you.